Today my guest is Brian Geneseo. Brian, how you doing? Doing great. Um, what do you want to talk about? Uh, well, I just talked about prison. Maybe we can... Prison? Pr prison. You want to talk about prison? <laughs> <laughs> prism I did as, my time. Yeah, as in rainbows and... Oh, prism. Oh, yes. that's very different. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, that's an excellent. So I, I enjoyed your talk earlier today on uh, prism. But uh, so what is prism? I think a lot of people have no idea what that is. So PRISM is really, a, it, it comes from Patterns and Practices Group and Microsoft. It is um, really two deliverables. The first one is a, a nice big document talking about how to create composite applications for WPF and Silverlight. That's the first half. The second half is uh, an actual reference implementation of libraries that help you to implement composite applications in WPF and Silverlight. Mm. Um, and so those two things together uh, is is essentially what PRISM is. Uh, and PRISM is a, is a code word for the Composite Application Guidance for WPF and Silverlight. So that was the former name of it? Uh, that, 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 is, so, that is the that They still use name. that officially. I, I don't hear that anymore. Yeah, that's official name. PRISM is the code word. Okay. And uh, so let's talk, uh, I'm more interested in the, the practical applications, the, the, the sample, or not sample applications, the framework and the, uh, the libraries okay. that uh, they published. Because you're using that right now to build applications, right? I am, yes. Right. Um, what does it take? What are the pieces of the application? Well, the... Uh, the, the I'm sorry, application is the wrong word. The framework, I think, is probably the right word. Is that yeah, right? maybe. I'd more call it uh, a library. Okay. That was considered to be a reference uh, library, but a lot of people have looked at it and said, hey, this is really nice code, and I think I want to use it in my own application. And so it's kind of picked, uh, um, picked up as uh, in popularity for people using this library for composable applications. Oh, okay, uh, you said that word a couple times, uh, composable applications. Mm -hmm. What is that? So, um, I like to use the analogy of uh, like a, a storage system. You know, a storage system may be nothing but a bunch of um, sliders and shelves that, that, that has nothing inside. And then you can go um, plug in drawers and, um, and doors and such based okay. on what you want. Um, how does this composability take place within, within Prism? How does it uh, decide um, this dynamically sure. loading the parts into the shell? Sure. So within Prism, there is a uh, there's a concept of a module. Okay. okay. And a module is really nothing more than a definition of views or user controls and services that are going to be plugged into um, the application. And so in other words, this application is going to be composed of the things that are in this module. Hmm. And there may be multiple modules. In fact, there often are multiple modules. Uh, you, can, you, can, you, can have a, you can have an area that uh, deals with navigation. Have, so have a navigation module. And you can have maybe a, um, a research module uh, that, that plugs in widgets that help you determine what you're going to buy um, if you're searching for things to buy. Okay. Got things like that, and so these modules really just define the views and the services that will be part of the application. Okay. And so modules are decoupled from each other, and essentially decoupled from the main application. They are brought together with something that's called the bootstrapper. Okay. And the bootstrapper defines which modules are going to be in the system. Mm. And there are many ways to do that. Um, the easiest way, but probably the least useful way, is to just statically. Um, uh, link them in and, and say we're going to add the module of this type which means you have to link in the project you have to compile it up and make it happen. so the easy way is to um, just uh, new up a bunch of uh, modules yeah it's not even the newing them up as much as saying use this module type okay well the system later on uses dependency injection to uh, to create them okay so it's unity or your iOS exactly. is going to take care of you actually doing them up for yeah. you um, and so you just kind of define them by type. But the problem with that, of course, is that you have to have the second file time, and you have to, um, that means you have to bring in project references or DLL references, and uh, you'll have to recompile if you want to change it. So they give you two other ways of doing it. Um, one way that works in WPF and Silverlight is you can just define it in a, uh, an external uh, XAML file, an okay. XML, basically an XML file that defines where to find these parts. Mm. And uh, when you do that, you can then just tweak the configuration and reload, and okay. everything shows up. Um, there's also one other uh, thing you can do in WPF, and that is a discovery mechanism where you can say, look in this folder for the DLLs that have modules, 
and it will then load them up. Kind of like the way Meth does, hmm. for instance. I looked at Meth a bit. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think you've done uh, a good job of describing the composability part of what Prism does. Uh, you've got. Let me make sure I understand it. Uh, there's a there's a shell that we build. There's a bootstrapper which dynamically loads up these modules. Um, maybe instantiates them through uh, an inversion of the control container through dependency injection. And then uh, the modules themselves take care of uh, bringing in the services and views of the application and telling the application where they go. Is, right. that, is that a fair summary? That's of very it? fair. Yeah, okay. Very fair. But that's not all the Prism is. Prism is also a lot of other uh, utilities. There's, there's, there's event handlers and. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, I know you talked about a lot of things. But just, sure. Just tell me else. So one of the one of the things that uh, that is part of this is something called the region manager. Okay. And this is the service that is responsible for taking views that are defined to go in a particular region okay. in the shell and actually creating them and putting them in the shell. Mm -hmm. uh, there are really two, there are two ways in which the region manager can do this. One is uh, through view discovery. And that is the case where a module says, I have this control, I want it to go in this region. Whenever this region shows up, please put me there. Uh, the other way is view injection, and in this case, something within your module is uh, specifically saying, take this control, this actual instance of a control, and put it in the region. Okay. And the real difference there ends up being, do you want it to kind of come up um, automatically, or do you want it to come in due to an event? Okay, that's that's something. That something is an event. Right. Something has happened that says, hey, I want to put something in there right now. I didn't want it to be there before, but I want it to be in there right now. And so if in the case of maybe a shopping application, that may be I, I've searched for items and I found it and I want to get details. And I click right. on that item. So that click would be that event. Um, that, that would be the event. And then the module, something within that module would then uh, create the details view and inject it into the region that the shell has defined as a place holder for this view. Okay, and then PRISM provides an event handling mechanism, doesn't it? Yeah, well it, it provides a, um, a, an inner module uh, way of communication. Um, it okay. doesn't have, even have to be inner module, it can be, um, you know, it, it's a decoupled communication mechanism called the event aggregator. Right. And an event aggregator is kind of like a data bus, uh, it's a publisher subscriber uh, system um, where uh, you just kind of fire an event and forget it. And if anybody's listening, they respond. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very decoupled way of doing things. One of the added benefits of using the event aggregator is that it does not hold on to references to the things that subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which uh, ultimately means you will not have memory leaks when you subscribe to the event handler because the event handler lives longer than anything else in the system, most likely. Okay. And um, and so it's it's a real benefit when it comes to uh, passing messages. And you don't you're completely decoupled. You don't even know who sent the message. You just know that the message exists. Okay. So a uh, this event aggregator is uh, useful for when you have some view in this part of your shell it wants to communicate with the view in this part of the shell, yeah. like like the click event. Exactly. So click something here. Wants something else to happen over here. These things are completely decoupled from one another. They neither one has any idea that this is the other. Right. But the event aggregator knows about both. Well, essentially, the event, all the event aggregator does is it passes messages along. So it doesn't even necessarily know. Oh, okay. It doesn't know specifically about these events even. It oh, just, so maybe they both know about the event aggregator. They okay. both, well, they both know about the event. The event, okay. So in a sense, the event becomes an interface in the system. Okay. It's defined and they both know about it. But it's, they know that the event aggregator exists and they know that the event exists. So okay. they ask the event aggregator to pass the messages. Understood, okay. Um, and any other pieces about Prism that? Uh yeah, well, there's there's also the commanding system that's okay. built in. Let's talk briefly um, about that. Sure, um, it, it's it's really useful for model view view model implementations, okay. uh, because in Silverlight three, uh, at least, you did not have built-in command capabilities. Uh, so what they did is they created a system that worked in Silverlight that would also then work in WPF and. Uh, it's, it's really nice, especially if you do have code that you're going to share between Silverlight and WPF. It can still communicate to your view models uh, the same way uh, as opposed to now uh, with Silverlight 3. It doesn't, it doesn't have the ability to hook up to commands without doing special wiring. Okay. 
And one thing you said in your presentation was that uh, you don't have to use all these pieces. You can it's, pick and choose what right. you want. That's one of the things I really, really like about this system is, you know, so I've written applications that have used nothing but the commands ah. because they they gave it to me and I needed them. Right. I've written systems that have used the commands and event aggregator but nothing else. Hmm. Um, and I've used systems that use everything um, except for a couple pieces that I've rewritten and plugged in because not only can you pick and choose the things that you want, you can also replace subsystems however you need. Um, it's really expensive that way uh, and replaceable. Okay. And what about Brian Geneseo? How can people find out more about you? So my blog is uh, houseofbills.com. That's B-I-L-Z dot com. Okay. Um, and um, I'm on Twitter as Brian Geneseo. That's G-E-N-I-S-I-O. All right. Yeah. Brian, thanks a lot for your time. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Well, thank you. I'd rather watch Technology and Friends than Fox and Friends. <laughs>